Hello, and thank you for joining us on tonight's Ask Andrew show, Canada's first live Facebook streaming family law question and answer show. My name is Andrew Feldstein, and I'm the principal of Feldstein Family Law Group. We have offices in Markham, Vaughan, Oakville, and Mississauga to serve your family law needs. Today, I'm joined by a special guest, Gary Stern, and the topic of today's show is marriage contracts and the impact on separation and divorce proceedings. Before I welcome Gary, I will say this. I refer to him a lot of marriage contracts from my office. Uh, he actually drafted my contract, so that should say something about uh, how I hold Gary's ability at drafting a contract. And uh, without further ado, Gary, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. Happy to do the show for you. So I wanted to start, if you could tell us a little bit about the ways in marriage contracts play a role in a separation or divorce proceeding. So marriage contracts in Ontario, unlike the United States, both parties need lawyers. Both parties have to make financial disclosure and you can't force each other to sign the contract. So as my wife says, a marriage contract is like insurance. You sit down with the other party, whether male or female, or same-sex partner, and you come up with terms in the eventual uh, demise of the marriage. So it brings certainty and confidence in the relationship. And of course, it can always be amended from time to time, depending on the nature of the circumstances of the parties. So I know most people, they think of a marriage contract, they call it a prenup. Uh, I remember when I used to do them, because our firm doesn't do them anymore, but when we did do them, uh, people would want to come in and say things like, I want a contract that's going to give my wife nothing. I never want to pay spuzzboard. I never want to pay equalization of net family property. And will that contract be enforceable? Would that be something you think is enforceable? I would have to say no. When clients come in and they ask to discuss with them marriage contracts, we talk about spuzzboard, for example. We talk about division of property. We explain the parties the law. And when one client wants to take what I call an unreasonable position and draft a contract which specifically says, like you say, I get everything, you get nothing. And if that person has means, I wouldn't even touch the contract. I tell people very simply, years later, if a judge looks at that type of contract, it's what I call the smell test. If the judge says it's too rich, the judge will set it aside in whole or in part. So I won't even draft that contract and I'll explain to the client why I won't draft the contract it's not really worth the paper it's written on. I always tell clients, you got to make it fair. You got to look at the other side. You got to look at where you're going to be in 10 years and where he or she's going to be in 10 years. So does that mean if someone comes to you and they're 30 years old and they want a contract, that's different than somebody who is 55 years old and on a second marriage coming to you with a contract? Absolutely correct. First of all, you have to look at their age. You have to look at their health. You have to look at their education. You have to look at their means and try to foresee the future. You don't want to do a contract or be part of a contract that is unfair. Or like I said earlier, some judge would look at it and say, it's not fair and we're going to set it aside. So you have to have what I call a meeting of the mind. So these days, the way we do contracts is a lot of times we actually have a four-way meeting. Ahead of time, we may exchange financial information. And then we sit down and we talk about each issue. So everybody has an understanding of what the deal is. Years ago, when we did contracts, what would happen is a husband or wife would come to you, you'd explain them law, you do their financial information, and you simply send it to the other side with a draft contract as to what your client wants. These days, we don't generally do that anymore. We sort of have a meeting and a discussion. At the end of the meeting discussion, when we agree what the contract's gonna say, we usually write a letter, either me or the other lawyer, or both of us, as to what we discussed, it's not the contract itself, but it's confirmation of what the contract's going to be. And then either one of us or both of us draft the contract. So we're sort of what we call joint authors. Well, the other piece that I heard you talk about is financial disclosure. And I'm going back and I'm thinking to when I did these things, how many clients would come in and say, I don't want to pay anything and I don't want to give any financial disclosure. Why do I need to tell my wife that, uh, I'm the beneficiary of a trust fund or I have a piece of my parents' company. It's none of their business. What well, do you say to that person? Well, generally, I would not take that person on as a client, first of all. I would direct them to the Family Act, Section 56, Sub 4, and 33, Sub 4, which talks about what makes up a contract in terms of validity. I would say to them, 
you have to make financial disclosure. And in terms of financial disclosure, there's an actual form. It's called a Form 13 Financial Statement. It's a four-page form. And everything the person has, whether it be an asset or a debt or an interest, you make full disclosure. And if it's a corporation, you give corporate tax returns, you might give a valuation. The better contracts are, the more paper that's given. And in fact, to try to bulletproof that issue, when we send the financial disclosure to the other side, which comes with an index, the sworn financial statement, all the backup documents, I invite the other lawyer to ask me if there's any financial disclosure they want or is missing. So later on, they can't take the position. You fail to give us disclosure. And those are the grounds we want to try to set it aside. So I, I think what you're saying really is to the client who comes in and thinks, I want a really unfair contract, or I don't want to say something to the other side, show them what I really have. Uh, they might as well not even bother with the contract. Absolutely correct. Now, it, it's interesting because we've talked a little bit now about the making of the contract and the way you go about formulating it. But then there's the, how does that, how does that impact the overall contract? And, and what do I mean by that is you talked a little bit about setting it aside. Now, I think most lawyers, when they're drafting, if they're doing their job properly, the first thought they have with respect to everything is trying to avoid the contract being set aside. That, That's correct, yes. And when I'm sitting there as a lawyer and somebody walks into my office for a consultation and they say to me, I have a contract, the first thing I'm doing is I'm looking at the contract to see it depends. Do I want the contract upheld or do I want it set aside? And the first thing I'm going to look at is was there financial disclosure? What was the quality of the financial disclosure? You agree with me on that? I absolutely agree with you. So the real challenge people who are watching have to understand if you go into a lawyer's office to get a contract done and they're your real estate lawyer or there's somebody that doesn't do family law and they're telling you you don't need to do disclosure, you might as well go take your cash, throw it in the fireplace and burn it. Because A, that money you're spending is garbage and B, what you got is garbage. So you need to really appreciate and understand how important the disclosure is. And go ahead, Gary, it looks like you were going to add something. Yeah, what I was going to say is I do the same thing. So the client comes in, they bring a contract in, whether it be a cohabitation or a marriage contract. As they're talking to me, I usually flip through the contract I speed read, unfortunately, and I look for three things similar to what you're talking about. So one, I look at the lawyer who gave ILA. Do I know him or her? And if I don't know him or her, it might be someone who dabbles in family law. That's the first thing. The second thing is I look for the financial disclosure, the paragraph in the contract that says what type of financial disclosure was given. And these days, a lot of times we actually attach some of the financial disclosure and we set out what disclosure was given. And then the third one, which I'm sure you do as well, is we look at the date of the contract and we look at the date of marriage. So you want to hopefully have a contract that was signed weeks, if not months before the actual wedding date or move in date. Otherwise, there's the issue of it was signed the day of or days before. Was the person compelled or forced or coerced to sign the contract? So those are the type of things that we look for or we think about as the person's talking about the contract. And, and when you say that, you know, you talk about looking at the lawyer. That's the first thing I do. And I always say to somebody, along with the disclosure, I look at the exact same things you do. But I always say to people, judges do the exact same thing we do. Yeah. And they correct. look at who are the lawyers that provided the independent legal advice. And if it's somebody that, oh, that's a good lawyer, right away, that judge's mentality is going to be much higher to enforce the contract than set it aside. Whereas if it's a lawyer, if you're thinking of doing a contract and you want to go to your real estate lawyer, your corporate commercial lawyer, or even somebody who claims to be a family law lawyer and has been doing it for two or three years, and unless they're doing it under the supervision of a senior lawyer, you're making a really big mistake. Because I think of a marriage contract as being probably the most important document you're going to sign. And at the same time as being the most important, if your marriage breaks down, it's the most likely document to have a dispute over as to whether it should be enforced or not. I agree with you. And actually, I take it one step per, further. Late, lately, I'm doing a lot of contracts for people on second or third relationships or marriages. Mm 
in which they're much older. I know earlier you talked about 30 and maybe 55. I do contracts for people like 70, 75, 80, believe it or not. And the first thing I do with them as well is I question their capacity because I don't want the other side to later on argue they didn't have capacity entry the contract or even their kids to say my mom or dad couldn't have done the contract. So a lot of times I ask them to go to their doctor, if the doctor and them have a history of a relationship, to give me a letter of capacity. And believe it or not, there is a psychiatrist who just does capacity assessments. It's about three and a half thousand dollars. So rather than use the traditional doctor who may not have the credentials, we send it off to this individual. He meets your client two or three times. He's a very well-known psychiatrist, he gives you a very nice report, and we attach to the contract for both of them the husband and wife, if that's the case, confirming their capacity. So later on, there should be no issue about challenging the contract on those grounds. And that, quite frankly, is a very smart tactic to take because, you know, we see a lot of the contracts when we're hired to set them aside. And I take that side rather than defending them. And you see so many of them that you can see were so poorly drafted by someone that really didn't know it or somebody did it online by downloading some contract. And, and I always remember one, this guy had a fair bit of money and he had his mail order bride and he insisted after they lived together for a year that she would sign a contract that gave her $2,000 of spousal support for every year that they were married. Not a month, $2,000. So 15 years later, they separate and he wanted to pay her $30,000. And the story there was that he took her to a member of her ethnic community's lawyer. She walked in with $200 cash that she gave him. And the lawyer signed his name as a certificate of independent legal advice on the contract. So we went to court to set aside that contract. Eventually we made a deal, but I can't imagine that when I asked for my client's former lawyer's file, he had no file. And all he did was put the cash in his pocket. And you have to think of, if you're going to a lawyer who's drafting that really one-sided agreement, and you're okay with the other spouse doing what I just described, that lawyer is also blowing it. Don't think as a viewer, my lawyer's really smart, really good, because they're getting them to go to somebody who will just sign it and rubber stamp it, and it's going to be a good contract. Because the lawyer who was okay with that may end up in just as much hot water when the agreement gets set aside as the lawyer that shouldn't have agreed to signing that contract, they both blown it. And just like you said at the beginning, if the contract's too good to be true, you won't be a party to it. Correct. Because judges these days we may not even set aside the whole contract. They might just set aside the spouse court provisions. You're talking about the $2,000 per year. So you have to make that, make the client aware of that. The other problem is, is we get the call. I'm sure you get the call all the time. I'm getting married on Sunday. <laughs> my client or I want a contract and you do it by Sunday. Those calls usually say, thank you very much, but I'm not the lawyer for you. Or in some rare cases, if you have an interest in the client and it's a short period of time, we'll do what's called a standstill agreement. So a standstill agreement is a, a contract, not a marriage contract. It simply says that although we're getting married on Sunday, no one acquires any rights. And later on, you're going to, re you're going to negotiate a contract. We do those in the odd case. Okay, so the message I think we're saying to people here is how important it is to do contracts the right way because, uh, you know, as you saw from some of the questions I was going to ask you, one of them was that can they be set aside? And the answer is absolutely. And the other thing you highlighted is sometimes the court will set it aside on support but not on property. Right. But... There's some other interesting twists that people don't appreciate. And if you're a dabbler, you probably don't know. Can you contract for possession of the home as an example? Well, that's a good question because I can tell you a story that I was involved with. So you can't, possessory rights cannot really be dealt with in a marriage contract. So possessory rights for your viewers is as follows. One, if the marriage ends, the other person has to leave within 60 days, for example. The second one is when you get married, the property becomes a matrimony home. So the other person is releasing their rights to claim exclusive possession or, for example, mortgage or seller encumbering. So when I do contracts, depending on who I represent, sometimes I put in paragraphs saying, in the event of a marriage breakdown, party A will leave within a certain period of time. And in the event the person has to sell mortgage or encumbered property, 
the person will consent. But I also add in the paragraph specifically says this is evidence of intention. It violates the Family Law Act, but it can be used against either party in the event the party takes the matter to court. And I can be honest with you, I've had one case where I drafted the contract and the other side used it against me to kick my client out of the house. So I can tell you, judges do uphold that provision if it's properly drafted and it makes sense to the judge. And I think part of making sense, if I'm right on the case you lost, there were either no kids or the other parent was clearly going to be the primary caregiver of the kids. It was the first scenario. There were no kids in your second marriage, yes. Okay, so that, that, that I could see the logic of it versus a first marriage where one person brought the house in and it's 15 years later. I'm not sure as much weight would be given about that. The other one I think people don't like to think about is when they're getting married, one person thinks, well, I'm going to be the caregiver, so I want custody, or now we say it, uh, primary decision-making, and to be the primary caregiver of the kids, they want to put that in the contract. I understand. Going back to a, a point you raised earlier, trying to make the contract what I call bulletproof. So all the clients, the well-to-do clients, let's say, want you to draft a contract, and they want an assurance that if the other side challenges the contract, it'll be upheld. And of course, no lawyer can give an assurance the contract will be upheld. However, there are ways to make it what I call bulletproof. So for example, what I do for a certain clientele is we draft the contract months before the parties get married. So there's no issue of financial disclosure, coercion, duress, and negotiation. And then what we do is during the first year of marriage, which I call the honeymoon stage, we amend the contract. So what I mean by amending the contract is my person who, let's say, has more money than the other party, gives the other party some particular asset, usually a significant asset. So we amend the contract. We go through the whole deal again. Both parties have lawyers. There's further financial disclosure. The contract is negotiated as opposed to drafted. Again, we have the meeting with all parties these days on Zoom, unfortunately, as opposed to face-to-face. -face. And we amend the contract. But we specifically state the original contract is valid. Only one paragraph is being amended. We list the paragraph that's being depleted. We list a new paragraph that's being replaced. And my client follows through with whatever he's giving his new partner. So therefore, later on, if the contract is challenged, you now have to challenge two separate contracts, two different dates with all the requirements in the Family Act being met. And that, that's really giving to our viewers an example of the great lengths you're going to. But I'm wondering, can people contract about where the kids are going to live? No, in a contract in Ontario or in Canada, you can't contract anything to do with children, whether it be decision-making, like we said, the old term being custody or joint custody, schedule time, child support, Section 7 expenses. You can re really only contract about spouse support, the matrimony home, businesses, or division of property. See, I, I once had a contract where the husband had taken the child to another country that was not a signatory to The Hague, and he said... I have the child here and I'm not going to come back unless you sign a marriage contract. Wow. And in the marriage contract, he gave himself sole custody and basically all the money. Interesting. So we brought a motion to have the contract set aside because my client signed it in order for the child to come back. Understood. Yeah. And of course the contract was set aside because you can't make a contract for custody and access. It was also very poorly worded. But you can see contracts that are very unusual. I mean, uh, we were talking before the show started about can you have contracts that require certain responsibilities about uh, marital relationships and child care while being married? That won't apply in Ontario. So you can't put any of that stuff in. A lot of clients will come in and want to be creative in terms of what they want the contract to say. I call it about intimate relationships. It's not enforceable. I won't even draft it. Sometimes I'll kick the client out of the office, not interested. Well, it, it's, it's funny because one of the things I told you about was I had a case where the husband provided a contract that said if they have a baby, he's not to be woken up in the middle of the night and he's not to do any pickup after school. He's not to bathe the child and all sorts of what he wasn't supposed to do. And there were all the responsibilities to the wife which included the fact that she wasn't allowed to go out with anyone other than her family members and one friend, and it limited how many times a week she was allowed to go out. Wow.
you know, and I, and I remember seeing that and thinking, will I ever see a contract like this again? And again, that's a message to people. If you come up with these kind of ideas or these kind of plans, you got to know it's just simply not worth the paper it's written on. And any lawyer who even is a party of drafting that, you really have to wonder what they're thinking when they're doing it. Because here in Ontario, it's a non-starter. In fact, I don't know if you'd agree with me on this, Gary, but if you were someone that actually got that contract signed, and even if you then inherited the file when they split up and you agree the contract isn't valid, if I was the other person's lawyer, I'd be waving that contract all along to show the power imbalance, the abuse, and everything that it says about a person who would create that contract. I agree with you. Agree. So when someone is being what they think is really smart, it's actually to their detriment. Because if you go that extra mile or you take that really ridiculous position of a contract that says nothing and then they get nothing and then you try to defend it more than likely a court isn't going to like it and then when there's other areas of discretion after they set aside the contract the court may even go that much further to harm your case because they're just not impressed with how controlling you're being in that situation so you really have to think like gary said about being fair in terms of the approach you're taking and fair doesn't necessarily mean fitting the legal model, but it means you're not going to say that after 20 years, somebody should be on the street and not have a place to live because that's not something a court's going to condone. Correct. The other thing is you don't want your name on a contract. That's foolish. It'll embarrass you in front of your colleagues and embarrass you in front of the judges and judges will not take you seriously later on. So I think you have a reputation and you should seriously think before putting your name on something. And, and that gets, that's a message to any young lawyers that are watching because you may be hungry for business right now. You may do something that you, you think is reasonable now. And 20 years from now, you may be the one who has a practice that's built up and a reputation that you didn't necessarily think you're going to get. And now that contract is going to be subject to uh, a, a court dispute. and You're going to be embarrassed for what you did early on in your career. So you really have to think about it and what you're getting yourself involved in. Uh, the other thing I want to ask you about contracts is, as we know, the Divorce Act was amended in March and it proposes to encourage mediation. Can you put in a marriage contract a clause that deals with saying if they separate, they're to go to mediation to deal with an issue or go to arbitration to deal with an issue? Or Yes. So most of my contracts where there's an issue of interpretation, possibly, or implementation, we always put in what's called the dispute resolution paragraph. And that can encompass a whole bunch of choices. For example, mediation. It could encompass arbitration. It can encompass mediation arbitration. Or it could encompass court. It all depends on what you negotiate and what the parties want. Sometimes we negotiate who the person is they're going to go to. Sometimes we put a fallback position. We try to be as creative as possible to avoid parties spending a lot of money in court if necessary by dealing with a mechanism that fits the situation. If it's a financial situation, for example, let's say it's a money issue, interpretation of someone's income, sometimes we actually appoint somebody like a, a certified account, a business evaluator, an accountant who has the credentials to do arbitration. Again, it all depends on the contract and what the and, issue may be. And do you think a court would enforce a marriage contract that requires you to go to arbitration? I would think so as long as properly drafted, yes. And my understanding from dealing with this issue in front of judges when there is a dispute resolution paragraph in the cohabitation or marriage contract, judges want to know to, if the parties followed the definition. So, for example, if it had mediation before the person ran to court, did they write a letter to the other side requesting it to go to mediation? And only when they did go to mediation, they went to court. So I think judges will follow it as long as it's properly drafted and they understand what the intent was. Okay. Now, how about marriage contracts from a foreign jurisdiction? Will they be enforceable in Ontario? Very good question. So the first issue is the courts will look to Section 58 of the Family Act, which I'll just quickly read to you. So it said contracts made outside Ontario, the manner and formalities of making a domestic contract and its essential validity and effect are governed by the proper law of the contract, except that a, a contract of which the proper law is that of a jurisdiction other than Ontario, is also valid and enforceable in Ontario if entered into in accordance with Ontario's internal law. B, 
subsection 33.4, setting aside provisions for support or waiver, and section 56, applying Ontario to contracts for which the proper law is that of a jurisdiction other than Ontario. And lastly, a provision in a marriage contract or cohabitation agreement respecting the right to custody of or access to children is not enforceable in Ontario. So in a roundabout way, so long as the requirements in that jurisdiction meet the requirements of Ontario, yes, they'll be upheld in a nutshell. And what does that mean for a religious contract like a mahar? Will they be upheld in Ontario? So there's lots of cases dealing with a mahar. I'll give you one case, for example. It's a court of appeal decision. It was made in 2015. And in that case, without giving the names of the parties, so in this case, the parents, the, app, the appellant's parents, transferred to one person a 50% interest in the house they owned at a particular address by way of a deed of a gift. Following the breakdown of the marriage, the person commenced a divorce proceeding. Along with, they also brought a proceeding to have the 50% set aside and transferred back to them. So in that case, the other side brought a motion for summary judgment. And what a motion for summary judgment is for your viewers is, it's a proceeding in front of a judge saying there's no genuine issue for trial. In that case, all the requirements that we talked about earlier, there was financial exposure, neither party was forced to enter into the contract, and the contract was negotiated in good faith. In that case, the judge upheld the contract. They said it was unconditional gift and that no genuine issue exists for trial. So that's just but one example. Another more, what I call traditional example, again, the Court of Appeal, and this is a standard contract in many uh, cases. The Mahar contained a clause requiring the husband to pay his wife 230 gold coins upon her prompt request. And of course, they challenged the validity of the contract. But in that case, so the wife in that case got an equalization payment, which is a form of division of property without getting in detail. And on top of that, the wife also got the mahar. In that case, it was 79580 So the contract was upheld to be valid. So the moral of the story is when you're signing these religious contracts and you think, ah, it's not a big deal. They're asking me to sign it five minutes before the wedding. It may very well be valid. And I know we talked about disclosure and independent legal advice, but the problems for my reading of these cases when you sign them is a, it's so simple that you clearly knew what you're doing because there's usually one or two pages that just says, if we break up, I'm paying X. Correct. And therefore, the financial disclosure isn't that relevant. It's hard to say you didn't understand the contract. And the problem people get into is I've seen some that may have one gold coin versus some that can have gold coins that can be worth three quarters of a million dollars. So when you're being asked to sign something on the day of a wedding for religious purposes, because it's like a dowry, yep. be very careful with the number you're putting in because that number may end up obligating you to something. Uh, there's some interesting cases in some of the Western provinces in Canada that say if the number being used is symbolic in nature, that may be a ground to set aside the contract. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. And you also have to look at the terms of the contract because some of the contracts have so many terms that we would call outrageous, the contract may be set aside. And in Ontario, you know, you talked about certain sections of the family law. One of them says if a contract was signed that's unconscionable, it can be set aside. But unconscionability is a really high threshold. Uh, is a case where someone promises to pay a million dollars when they're worth 100000 unconscionable? It may very well be because the other reality is all the person's going to do is go file for bankruptcy because they have nothing. So things have to be taken into account. The bottom line of what I'm really saying is to people, don't think because it's religious, it's not binding. There's a good chance it will be binding and you may regret it. I see that our time is up, Gary. I wanted to thank you for uh, coming on the show today. It was a pleasure having you. I really do appreciate you sharing your experience and expertise with us. The next Ask Andrew show will be uh, the last one of the year on December 15th at 7.30 p.m. If you have any requests or ideas for future shows, please email them to us at info at feldsteinfamilylaw.com. And thank you for watching. Thank you for having me, Andrew.